morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We are continuing our discussion on S-119, an act relating to a statewide use of deadly uh, force policy for law enforcement. And uh, we were continuing our testimony from yesterday. I really appreciate the uh, witnesses' flexibility. And uh, so we're going to start with uh, Chief Burke and, uh, and then Chief, I'll just I don't know if you, or if you can watch the time or if it's better for me to give you the time so we can hand it over to the commissioner. What, what would be helpful to you in terms of staying on, on track? Certainly, just feel free to stop me now. Okay, all right, great. And again, if you, if you don't finish, we'll, we'll make sure we get back to you. So good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for being here and, and for your flexibility. Appreciate it. Good morning and thank you. My name is Sean Burke and I truly appreciate this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Vermont Chiefs Association. I've had the privilege of serving in Vermont law enforcement for the last 26 years, and I am committed to meaningful police reform. The Chiefs Association greatly appreciates the sense of urgency and careful attention your committee has placed on this critical area of police reform. Police use of force has many citizens confounded. Our association quickly joined the Department of Public Safety and other stakeholders in creating a 10 point strate strategic plan for police reform in the wake of George Floyd's death at the hands of the Minneapolis police. We strongly urge Vermonters to follow the governor's executive order and take a methodical evidence-based approach to police reform. Vermont law enforcement desperately needs a single system where all officers report force. This will allow a fulsome data capture and an opportunity for all Vermonters to understand when, why, and how their police use force. Additionally, Vermont law enforcement needs a mandated model use of force policy that is developed with subject matter experts, advocacy groups, and the broader community as part of a completely transparent process. A statewide model policy will embrace the terms of procedural justice, allowing Vermonters to understand when the police need to use force and why. This allows citizens the ability to judge whether those actions are fair and reasonable. I have listened to a vast majority of the testimony and feel that the urgency of this bill revolves around instances when the police create the exigency to use force. This legislation does nothing to prevent that. Strong policy and training standards will only prevail. The Attorney General and the Washington County State's Attorney affirm this reality. Many agencies, to include the one I lead, subscribe to the Police Executive Research Forum Integrated Communication Assessment and Tactics Training Program. This program focuses on the sanctity of human life, de-escalation, and a decision-making model for officers when dealing with force situations. The foundation of this program is in communication and active listening, as that is de-escalation. This curriculum also leverages scenario-based training, the most effective training model for adult tactile learners. When officers can slow the tempo of an incident, isolate dangerous persons, and create time and distance, other resources can be brought to bear. In Vermont, we are dealing with both a substance use disorder and mental health crisis. So many of our neighbors suffer without adequate resources driving them into acute states of crisis involving suicidal and homicidal thoughts and actions. The Vermont Department of Mental Health's interpretation of the DSM-5 precludes substance use disorder as a major mental health condition. Countless times we de-escalate situations and try to get our most vulnerable community members help. The resources are not there. We see these vulnerable folks several times a week in desperate places, but there's little action to build capacity to pre prevent these crises. Robert Appel testified that the police are responding to these calls, exuding control as opposed to connection. Vermont needs to build the resource connection that averts the crisis. Many of the questions that have arisen in this committee regarding the decision process officers must use when employing force are clearly identified in the Graham standard, the defined constitutional standard that exists today. Those standards are made clear in good use of force policies. I have shared the South Burlington policy with you by way of example. I have also heard that policy is not enforceable. This is not true. Police policy is the rigor of our organizations and leaders that fail to follow policy need to be held to account. Responsible police leaders do enforce their policy. 
The, L the ACLU eloquently testified that police misconduct is quickly swept under the rug by qualified immunity involving use of force cases, citing an outrageous California incident. I urge you to look at the civil suits filed in U.S. District Court in Vermont. You will see evidence of police agencies being held to account for the use of force instances that don't even begin to resemble the California incident described by the ACLU. Early in this legislation, Attorney General T.J. Donovan testified that words matter. The words necessary, feasible, and should have known lack the statutory definition in supporting case law to be clear and effective. Let's take the time to collect the data and develop a model policy that can guide our law enforcement officers in a way that Vermonters understand and trust. Let's see how the opaque terms of necessary, feasible, and should have known survive in court. Vermonters are careful and strategic. This area of police reform deserves the same. Thank you for your time and work on this area of critical police reform. Our association stands with our constituents ready to do this work. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your testimony. I, I do have a question. You said that, um, that you do in fact enforce your policies um, in response to the concern that policies are not enforceable. Could you, um, could you please uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly, um, and let's, let's stay on the topic of critical incidents. Anytime that you have a critical incident, whether that's a, you know, a use of force, a high level of use of force or a vehicular pursuit, you have to do an after action review to examine uh, the process that the officers went through in making their decisions and the actions that they took and uh, compare that obviously to your policies, identify if there were any missteps by the employee or if the policy was ineffective or for exposing our community to unnecessary risk. And that's just good responsible police management that you know, police chiefs do around the state every, every week. Thank There's you. also you know, another area where when uh, you can have two forms of complaints, oftentimes a complaint will begin internally about conduct and oftentimes citizens will reach out to the police department and uh, offer a criticism or a complaint. It's uh, taking that responsibility serious and which has been made much, much more clear post Act 56 in 2018, investigating those incidents, uh, comparing the conduct that has been alleged with all the available evidence, determining whether or not that the employee either acted within policy, made a mistake, or made a calculated decision to violate policy or law, and then holding that employee to account. Thank you. Uh, Martin, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chief Burke. Um, so I, I definitely respect what you've done with uh, South Burlington Police Department and, and uh, the way that you are uh, managing that part department and uh, think that that uh, we're doing a, a good job in, in Chittenden County overall, although there are people who dis definitely disagree about that with respect to some incidents in, in Burlington, but uh, certainly in South Burlington, uh, I do really appreciate your efforts in uh, 21st century policing uh, reform and I've had discussions with you and I want to make very clear that uh, you've been ex extremely helpful earlier this year, for instance, with respect to trying to figure out how to deal with uh, firearms in the situation where there's been a domestic uh, dispute. So uh, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and, and I largely agree with what, you've, what your testimony was, but there are a couple pretty important points of disagreement. I do have a couple questions that uh, kind of come from that. Um, First of all, you know, I, I agree that absolutely policy is necessary. Uh, the policy that you spoke of, uh, what uh, the executive order is requiring, uh, what I believe uh, the AG is going to uh, testify to a, uh, an al some alternative language uh, kind of modeled after the fair and impartial policing uh, bill uh, or statute and policy. Uh, but it, I, that is extremely important. Uh, but, but I feel that, that we need also a statutory standard and overlay uh, since the legislature, the state has created law enforcement agencies and has given the law enforcement agencies the duties, uh, including the use of force in you know, exercising adjudicative processes such as serving warrants and, and public safety, et cetera, and enforcing our laws. Uh, so I, it, and we also have put into place uh, some guideposts, but they're very ancient and they're in the uh, justifiable homicide statute. 
uh, and it's very broad, probably at this point unconstitutional, given some of the Supreme Court um, uh, cases uh, related to uh, Fourth Amendment and use of force. So I, I believe we have an obligation, frankly, to uh, put forth uh, a standard in statute. Uh, but it's not just an obligation. I want to go to the question of the, the issue that you said about uh, enforcement of policy. <clears throat> and and uh, I also don't disagree that there's enforcement of policy within uh, law enforcement. Uh, but people are asking for, and, and, and it, I think it's legitimate that citizens should have uh, an opportunity to have access to justice in the court system uh, and, and either exercise through their prosecutors and state's attorneys uh, or through uh, civil, civil suits. Uh, I do believe qualified immunity is important and, and is, is something that is, is necessary. I think it's, uh, it'd be great to have it uh, modified somewhat, but, but, uh, but I'm not opposed to, to their qualified immunity. In any event, in, in the training specifically, uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council manual uh, states that generally speaking, a violation of a department policy can result in sanctions or punishments from your department. Uh, and if the cause, clause of the policy that is violated mirrors the law, uh, it can also result in criminal charges or lawsuits. But it's that latter part, it, you know, the policy mirroring the law. And I don't think we have that in uh, certainly in statute right now. And, and I do think that that's something we, we need. Um, I guess, uh, you know, if you could you know, comment on that, that concept that having the legislature in statute, it kind of a high level, uh, you know, I guess we could call it a floor uh, as far as uh, use of force and use of deadly force. And in specific, specifically, if you have this at all, it, it looking at the language that we have in draft 2.4, what in particular gives you cause? What are the what are the parts that really concern you of having something in statute uh, in conjunction with good policy that comports with the statute? I the, wonder if you are able to to comment specifically on any of the language that we have. Yes, sir. Uh, specifically, the three terms that I highlighted. Um, you know, necessary. I think that is going to be the standard. You know, you're you're uh, obviously a far better um, examiner of the law than I am. But the Graham standard is old. I feel that uh, the tide is turning, and that probably will have a new federal standard. But I think it's critically important that our state standard match that of the federal standard because, yes, we operate at a state level um, here in Vermont in the way we police our citizens, the way we hold our officers accountable, but we are also held accountable in, to the federal court when our agencies are sued. And I think that those standards need to match because as, as critically as important of an issue it is to have this police reform on deck and ready to go, we can't then expose ourselves to undue lit litigation in federal court or things that are far, far less clear with two different standards. I think that's largely problematic. I also think the term feasible is not at all well-defined uh, in terms of when we have to make these critical decisions. And then uh, lastly, should have known. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Martin, uh, that in 1997, I investigated a, a domestic violence incident and uh, the, the survivor of that incident reported to the police station physically. We built the evidence. We went to make the arrest. The survivor never told us that her boyfriend was suicidal and armed with a gun in the house. Martin, when we arrived, he was in a bedroom with his other roommates. There was no way that we could retreat. During this, um, during this incident, he eventually put the gun down, but he wouldn't walk away from it. The room wasn't at all oriented to where we could get between him and the gun. At this time, I had a backup officer. I holstered my gun and I grabbed that kid for all I was worth and brought him to the floor, but he was able to grab the pistol. And as he and I struggled for that gun, he wanted to kill himself. <clears throat> he shot himself in the head, Martin. And what should have 
what should have I known? And who gets to judge that after the fact? That's very, very concerning. So uh, I agreed, uh, you know, the, the, the should have known uh, from other discussions and looking at it further is particularly problem problematic. Uh, at, at a minimum, I'm going to be recommending that we take that language out. Uh, I understand the concern about, let's talk about necessity. I want you to comment on this. Uh, yesterday, uh, Attorney General Donovan, uh, in his testimony, stated that uh, the use of deadly force should be a last resort. And I believe if we take out what is in this draft, defining what necessary means, uh, then our standard that we have in here does not, it doesn't result, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, deadly force is, is a last resort. But I guess the qu a question I would have for you and another thing that uh, something else that's been raised as a possibility, if, if we have the effective date of this law say middle of next year uh, to provide the opportunity then to flesh out some of those issues in policy. Uh, does that assist as far as the concern, as far as we're gonna say, but, but, and, and let me go to your other point that you made as far as we wanna follow federal law. And I assume that you're meaning federal law is developed by courts as opposed to in the legislature because we'll be waiting a long time, I think if it's the latter. Um, but right now, what the necessary has is, I think, does go a little further than what is in the federal court. So I think it's fine if we have a standard that is a little more uh, uh, restrictive or, or goes beyond just what uh, is in the federal law. Um, but, but I think that having necessary at least in there that, you know, we're, we're, we are going to require uh, that essentially this is a last resort. We're going to give the experts, as you say, and uh, through the process uh, to provide some meat on those bones where it properly is, which is in policy. Right? Is that, but does that help? I mean, does that address your concerns at all? I have time to stay, and I noticed that the commissioner just tuned in, and I want to be respectful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so hold that hold that thought, <laughs> and we'll uh, switch to the commissioner. And um, thank you. I really appreciate your flexibility, Chief. Okay. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. I can always come back, Madam Chair. I'm I'm here all the time. So if if you're knee deep with uh, Chief Burke, by all means, don't let me disrupt no, that. That's okay. We we've given him a, a heads up. So, and uh, appreciate you coming back as we didn't get to you yesterday. So. So welcome. Thank you for thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, uh, there is an enormous topic. Uh, is there an area that would be most useful um, where the committee has concerns or questions, or would you like uh, me to just walk through a sort of a broad overview um, of this? I'm going to look for hands to see if any of the committee members do have questions. Uh, I'm not, I'm not seeing them. So, so go ahead and then I'm sure we'll have questions after. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, this is going to be an incredibly abbreviated version of this. And uh, so, and, and I know you've heard of a variety of this as, uh, as well. Um, among the most important points, um, we are very much uh, uh, in public safety an organization and a profession that is uh, constantly iterating, evolving, changing, uh, I use the term modernizing, and uh, there's no place where that occurs more than in policy related uh, to the use of force. Um, You've heard from witnesses uh, indicating that there's a lack of guidance here. Um, I, I would dispute that. I believe there is more guidance. There are more guardrails. There is more. There are more rules that have been set forth by the courts on this topic uh, in this area of operations than any other. Uh, there are literally treatises written on this topic. Um, the use of force on a person 
uh, by law enforcement is a seizure. Um, it's subject to the Fourth Amendment, subject to Article 11 in the Vermont Constitution. And as a result, there's an enormous amount of case law that guides um, that. Uh, there has been testimony that we're resistant to um, a statutory construct because we're resistant to being regulated. There is no more regulated arm of government than law enforcement. We are not in any way resistant uh, to being regulated. Uh, we're regulated by statute. We're regulated heavily by case law. Uh, we're regulated by our um, uh, not only at a state level, but at a federal level and at a municipal level uh, on a host of topics that are too innumerable to uh, to even mention. But use of force, again, being at the top of that list. Um, the the resistance is about creating better outcomes. Um, we are better suited to be able to train and to improve the way we operate by memorializing uh, innovation and new things, whether that's new community standards, uh, new ways of doing things or new techniques. In this case, we're talking about community standards uh, by memorializing that in policy. Um, California actually is an interesting example because their most recent use of force statute is a new version that was necessitated by the fact that their old version was found to be unconstitutional. Now, granted, it was fairly old, but it is in part illustrative of uh, the one of the challenges, which is that uh, a statutory framework can't evolve uh, as, as rapidly as policy does. And we are sometimes making policy updates on a monthly basis as we gain experience, as the courts make rulings, et cetera. Um, I lost my train of thought, which happens more frequently as I get older. There was something right there uh, as the next point and it's gone. Um, I will work on trying to come back to it. Those are there, there's much, much more here uh, to discuss, and, and I have pages of notes, but I, it probably makes sense, to, uh, given the tight timeline, to to turn it uh, to you, Madam Chair, and and explore wherever the committee would would like to go. And that that last point or two that's hanging right there and not readily accessible in my notes will come to me. I'm sure it will. Thank thank you. Uh, again, looking for, uh, let's see, okay, uh, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, Secretary Sherling, how are you? Um, so I have a question in looking at, um, can you hear me okay? I'm using your phone, okay. there, my neighbor's having tree work done. Um, it's very loud. So um, it looks like there were 17 deaths um, that were caused by law enforcement in the last decade. And in hearing um, the attorney general testify yesterday about some of the cases that he, um, the way the statute's written now, was not able to um, find any of the ones he was referring to as wrongful um, use of force. It looked like all 17 of these cases, um, there weren't any charges made against law enforcement. And this was an increase for Vermont over previous years, it looked like. So I'm wondering, given all the statutes and um, case law, it doesn't seem like we're um, minimizing the number of deaths. And I'm wondering, um, hearing the ACLU testify yesterday about putting that floor in place seemed to make a lot of sense to me about, um, sure, we still need policies, but why not set a bar for um, minimal expectations? So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. Sure. Uh, you've actually brought me to the, the next point that I had forgotten, which is um, the statutory construct will actually create more ambiguity than it will consistency in the near term. 
because it will take years to get case law established to interpret uh, the words that you choose to put on paper. We have the ability now to put words on paper in policy that we can very clearly de define and delineate based on the community standard that you'd like to exercise um, that will make that immediately immediate change and create clarity without that ambiguity. And, and without, um, some folks took offense to this piece of testimony yesterday, so I do it uh, cautiously. Um, it will create litigation that in part will not be particularly well-founded. Um, it's no secret that you can make money in the legal system if there is ambiguity uh, around what something means. So you can uh, sue government, and this will happen, there's, there's no question in my mind, that we'll see an increase in lawsuits because there will be an increased chance that people can win be because we will not know what the language means. So not necessarily because we've made a mistake, but because there's ambiguity in whether uh, there's a payday at the end of that. So um, there, again, there we're we are on the. I, I can't overstress this, and I know other people have testified that we are not on the same page relative to the 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 need. Um, and our desire to have better outcomes in these events. And uh, what we're trying to do is uh, provide you with some alternative structures to get there faster, more uh, deliberately, and with greater clarity um, than this particular approach. And let me just add one more thing to that. The, one of the challenges Historically, in government in general, in Vermont in particular, we love local control. 251 towns, we all, we're all special, we know how to do things, and that's great. And I don't, I'm, I'm not saying what I'm about to say to diminish the fact that the nuance um, related to local control sometimes has incredible value. This is not one of those places. This is a place, and there are a number of other areas of operations in law enforcement in particular, where I think a singular statewide way of doing things is absolutely essential. And we have been collectively hesitant to do that in the past. Now is the time to absolutely do that. Same thing with hiring process, promotional process, how do we select our chief executives, et cetera, community oversight models, a lot of the other things we're simultaneously talking about. And then how the question then becomes, if, if that's the policy direction, how do we create accountability for that? And the answer I believe is twofold. One, uh, you'll, there's, al there's already language in uh, S-124, which is now in the House, uh, that enhances the ability to decertify an officer for a use of force violation. And then on the agency side, S-119 began to lay some groundwork for uh, essentially eradicating an agency's ability to be an agency. Um, it started with grant money, which is what's uh, removing grant money, which is in uh, 219. What I would suggest is going further than that uh, for these key topic areas, whether it's adoption of fair and impartial policing, use of force, reporting race data, that not only do you not have access to grant money, but you don't have access to training and you don't have access to the information technology systems that the state provides that are the foundation for being a law enforcement agency. So it essentially becomes uh, federal highway dollars. If you fail to adopt the key best practices, you don't have access to those dollars. And how would we um, make sure that people are following protocol? Um, who's reviewing that? And how do we know that it doesn't sort of get lip service, but there's a workaround? That's a great question. And one of the things we're actively working on now uh, as a result of the governor's uh, executive order, and we had started this work uh, prior uh, with the 10 point strategy that we put forth in June um, is uh, for lack of a better description, um, a different way of doing internal investigations, uh, uh, a, a more independent uh, version of that where individual agencies uh, that don't have uh, operations in multiple parts of the state would have a, a collective unit that could do that, uh, that was in part independent. And then community oversight is the next piece of that. And putting forth models, it, it has, of course, been observed that 
whether it's in state government and it's the General Assembly or if it's in a town or city and there's a select board uh, or council, that there is community oversight. But we're going to be putting forth uh, together with a variety of subject matter experts and partners some templates for more direct community oversight models uh, that can be used. So you're describing exactly where we believe we need to go, which is a fabric of different approaches or different components of an approach to ensure that we've got, it, it starts at the beginning, right? Hire the right people, train them correctly, hire the right supervisors, hire the right executives, uh, have good investigations, have good policy, and then have good oversight at the other end of that tunnel. And it all weaves together to create the outcomes that we want. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, um, so I'm not sure if you got to hear Councilwoman um, Hightower's testimony yesterday about um, it being done at the local level ends up getting more sort of contentious and um, trying to think of the word she used, but, but she painted a pretty clear picture of um, her recommendation of removing it from that local level where it ends up being more about um, or can be framed more about people than policies and outcomes. And you know Burlington really yes. well, so I'm just wondering your, your take on that. Yeah, I, I think there is some validity there. And the one of the constructs that we're, we're actively looking at now is something um, actually that I think Curtis Reed came up with as we were brainstorming in June, an idea of, of regional investigations. And it is, uh, I should call out that I think this, I'm relatively new to, to public safety, having been here just a year. And I one of the things I'm incredibly impressed with is uh, the 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 system that the state police has that is uh, memorialized in statute and then carried out that uh, the way the internal investigations are done, and there's been some criticism of unions. I've been incredibly impressed with the collective bargaining agreement and the fact that there are clearly delineated penalties for different kinds of conduct. Um, the system works uh, very well. Uh, and replicating that kind of a system I think is is where uh, we're we're hoping to go on a on a statewide basis. So, having s folks that are trained investigators from other parts of the state that have no interest in uh, or no knowledge of the people they're investigating is the way it's done in state government. We're suggesting, uh, and I say, I'd say we collectively with the chiefs and sheriffs and others. It's not the Department of Public Safety trying to superimpose this. It's something we're all working on together. Uh, creating those those models um, for use statewide. So I think that goes to uh, Councillor Hightower's uh, concern. And th the same kind of oversight is something we're working uh, toward framing on uh, community oversight as well. So in a small town, um, Burlington is a small town. All of our towns are small towns. You don't have folks that work together every day that are doing that level of community oversight, that it's uh, it's a representative model um, using the brilliance of representative government that we enjoy here uh, in the United States and in Vermont for a couple centuries plus. Uh, Martin. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thank you for the work you've been doing uh, in the Department of Public Safety with the 10 point plan and also with what uh, with, uh, it certainly looked uh, like you were behind the executive order and, and I applaud that as well. I, I think that's lots of good work that you all are doing. Uh, and also uh, with respect to the use of force policy, but uh, I wanna just talk a couple of underlying assumptions and then I do have some specific questions as well. Uh, First of all, kind of the basic premise that I've taken into this, and, and, and I like your last statement about the brilliance of representative government because it goes right to that, uh, is that the representative government created the, the law enforcement agencies uh, and also gave them the duties and uh, also gave them the right uh, to use force to exercise those duties. Uh, and also, uh, at one point, uh, put some guardrails around the exercise of 
deadly force, and that's in the justifiable homicide statute, which uh, whenever uh, the various articles that I've read, uh, law review articles and others talking about state laws dealing with use of force, they always point to our justifiable homicide is that that's our use of force uh, statute. Uh, it's it's uh, probably unconstitutional. It's it's uh, certainly uh, very old uh, and needs to be replaced. And and so I see that this is an obligation of this uh, brilliant representative government to actually update uh, that standard, uh, but also recognizing that a lot of the details of this uh, needs to be worked out. Uh, in in policy, uh, you know the day to day how how the overall arching standards are implemented is certainly appropriate in policy, and I'm uh, very eager to see what uh, is going to come out of the efforts for for that. But I would like it to comport with uh, a standard that we set at uh, a sufficiently detailed but also high enough level that we're not micromanaging, but we're setting forth the overarching standard. And I in looking at um, the current law, which is mostly federal courts, you know, beside, you know, let's jettison the justifiable homicide uh, component of this because it's, like I say, unconstitutional. But it's it's not. I mean, it's not as. I think it's not as un unambiguous as you say. What's even the current law, and and what I've tried, and I'll have some specific questions here. Uh, is is looking at certain of these uh, aspects of, of uh, the common law, the, the law developed in the courts, mainly federal courts. Uh, and there's some areas that I think that some circuit courts have it right and some do not. And I think that we should adopt the ones that I think have it right. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, the one is with respect to conduct of the police officer leading up to a use of force. Uh, there are some circuits that say, no, we will not look at that. Uh, and there are other circuits that say that we we do look at that, that that is part of the consideration for whether uh, the use of force was objectively reasonable. Uh, there's also uh, disagreements about how important policy uh, of local agencies are uh, with respect to whether the policies should be looked at. Uh, the way I think we resolve that is that we, we combine having a standard and statute with uh, having uh, well-defined policy that helps us implement that. So I do want to make very clear that one of the suggestions I'm going to have for this legislation, this bill, uh, and there, and I'm hoping to get some input from you on some others that we can still modify, is that we have uh, an effective date uh, well into 2021 to give the opportunity to have that policy developed uh, that comports with uh, the standards that we would be setting forth in statute. So having said that, I mean, if you're able to I mean, if if may, maybe you're unwilling to to do this, or are you still even there? Did we lose? No, you're still there. You just are off. I am. Um, yeah, I apologize. So, um, if you're able to explain what particular parts of this bill are 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 egregious to you, uh, maybe you're unwilling to. You know, in other words, I'm asking you. I understand that you disagree uh, with the concept and would rather kill the bill, but I'd like to, if you're willing to tell me how to make what you think is a bad bill uh, something that uh, is workable, if you have any input in, in that respect. Yeah, uh, I would need quite a bit more time and to, uh, to bring in uh, some additional subject matter experts. I think you're going to hear from Drew Bloom. I think Chief Burke may, be, may speak to some of those components. It, it is, it, the, the fundamental concern is that when new words are added, words the courts have not used in prior guidance, um, that we will have to try to figure out in the near term what, how to operationalize them. And we will be wrong. There, the, the, there's no way to know exactly how the courts are going to, um, there's just no way to be accurate in, in our efforts to craft training and policy around them. It's just not the way um, the system works when you when you create laws the courts interpret them and they and they interpret them based on a variety of different factors and you can never be uh, there can never be pinpoint accuracy there so the the concerns will be around specific kinds of language that we will not know how to interpret I would offer though that in the spirit of trying to go to a place where 
we're operating under our uh, the current community standard that one way to approach this would be to take that language um, or, or take the key constructs that that you've called from um, circuit court decisions and things of that nature and create a turn the bill into a directive to adopt policy that addresses those specific things and uh, and give us a crack at that. Um, and if we fail, the legislature comes back every year. Um, you, in, as early as 12 months from now, you could take another run at a, a, a more directive statutory construct. Um, what we're suggesting is we want to go uh, we want to go where you want to go. We're just trying to find the way to get there that will create clarity and an ability to operate in a, in a fast paced, constantly evolving operating environment. I, I haven't talked much about that, um, but it's important to flag that uh, that clarity and consistency has to exist because the nature of the events that are being responded to on a day-to-day -day basis, even in a, relatively peaceful place like Vermont are just, it, it's an overwhelming amount of, uh, of chaos that can occur uh, even in our tiny state. So actually, hold on. Um, I just, I wanna make sure, Commissioner, I know you need to get to another meeting. Do you have, I see other hands. Do you have more time? Or yes, do you need when, to when I disappear, I am, uh, I'm texting the press conference to tell them my status. Okay. But I, I, so I can stay a few more minutes. Okay, so Martin, I do see that that um, Coach's hand is up. So if I could, I'd like to give Coach um, some time to get get his question, and then Tom as well. So thank you. So Coach, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Burke. Uh, Chief Caston uh, sends his best to both of you. Uh, I was multitasking like uh, the commissioner with him because he's watching uh, as we're having our discussion. But he said to say hi to both of you. Um, thinking in terms of structure um, as far as creating a vehicle that the legislature, uh, and this gets back to uh, uh, Representative Lalone's uh, uh, structural concern about the framework and then the commissioner's uh, thoughts around standing up a directive and having the accountability. So um, I'm thinking, and it's kind of a question discussion type of uh, of question you can't fix what you can't measure so we'd have to have a way of uh, measuring you know the results and within that new um, modernized uh, electronic system that you're working on I, I guess my question would be, you had talked about before in one of your uh, visits to our committee about that being a statewide system. Um, so that then goes to those 251 entities and it uh, gives us collectively a way of measuring specifics. Um, can you speak a little bit to that uh, Absolutely, sir. That's an excellent point. Um, y yes, we are we're still on uh, the, the as fast a track as we can do in state government uh, to a, a unified computer-aided dispatch and records management system that would be available to all agencies and be able to both uh, take in uh, use of force reports and then report them back out both in a dashboard form that's easy to digest for folks that are not technically uh, savvy, but also raw data that could be looked at by researchers and unpacked in a variety of different ways and probed in ways that we might not even think to ask. Um, we have some prototypes of that uh, that 
uh, exists now within the state police. I, I think I shared a, a static shot with this committee in maybe February uh, of a use of force um, dashboard um, that's interactive and uh, what well, the static version wasn't, but it would be interactive. And, and uh, that's exactly where we're headed. Also of note, um, we're in active conversations also around this 10 point plan around making available to other agencies in Vermont the early warning system uh, for officer performance that we use in the Department of Public Safety. So the, the most impactful work we can do is actually downstream of the use of lethal force or any force for that matter. Uh, to refresh you on the statistics, in 2018, uh, the state police handled about 118,000 calls for service. Uh, 223 of those resulted in some kind of force used beyond compliant handcuffing. In 2019, that number was 115,000 events and 183 of them resulted in some use of force that was beyond compliant handcuffing. Um, we also track other officer uh, performance uh, and small, everything from small errors to policy violations and using that system as a way to improve performance and correct action at its earliest possible level, sort of like a medical model where if you intervene in a, an illness or an injury faster, you have a better outcome, same principle. That's the way modern law enforcement works. Not all agencies are large enough to be able to have those kinds of systems. So one of the things we're talking about with the 10 point plan and with this modernization strategy now is to be able is to find ways uh, to allow others to use those kinds of early warning systems as well. So not only, as Senator White would observe, has the General Assembly done a lot around certification, decertification, and standards uh, over the last few years. At the same time, uh, we've been actively working on more granular versions uh, of that accountability, early warning, uh, tracking data, et cetera, all to improve outcomes and to prevent uh, violent encounters to prevent crime, to prevent um, emerging health issues, to track opiates, et cetera. It, it all, at one point or another, it all weaves together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. And then Martin, if, if the commissioner still has time. Thank you. Hello, Commissioner. Uh, glad to see you at the, at the table here. And um, uh, if, if I had my preference, uh, you would have been at the table a long time ago um, while this bill was being, I guess you could say, built. Um, there was legislators and advocates and, in my opinion, political organizations um, that were at the table. Um, and they were all discussing basically you and what you do. And, um, and I, I just think that if 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 you if you or your office was at the table at the time, um, maybe we would be a little further along <clears throat> as far as the debate um, or less debate goes in this bill. Um, as far as your testimony goes, um, I, I don't want to hear an abbreviated testimony. I, I want I want to hear your testimony, and, um, and and I know you're you're uh, you know on a time constraint. Uh, we're on a time constraint. And unfortunately, with this bill, I've heard several times, you know, you, you have to give an abbreviated testimony, no time. I've heard, you know, people talking about this bill saying we have deadlines and there's timelines. And, and now you, uh, you brought up that you have some other witnesses that would be, uh, sounds like would be very pertinent to this bill um, that, that I want to hear, um, which is going to give us uh, more time constraints. Um, and uh, whether no matter what's in this bill, whether it's in statute or policy, it, it can't be rushed. And, and, and I really feel right now that, that, that it's being rushed. But um, I, I guess I'm really not asking you any questions. But um, I, I guess uh, the only question I guess I'd have is who are these other uh, witnesses that um, you mentioned earlier, and, and I would love to get them on the agenda at some point. So, uh, uh, while it's not a question, Representative, uh, I will make an observation. Um, the, the witnesses, I guess if I had my druthers, I, I would actually um, bring you all to, a, uh, to class on, on this topic. 
um, essentially teach you what it is we teach basic recruits on the use of force on search and seizure in this particular realm um, and have you hear it all directly because it is the most complicated area of operations and of law. And, and frankly, I, I told the Senate committee this yesterday, I, I've both listened to some testimony that's been taken on this topic and I've read uh, others and I'm, I'm a little scared because I think that there it has been information presented to committees that is not accurate. And I don't believe that's malicious. It's just this is the most complicated area of criminal law that there is. There's no two ways about it. There's a gentleman named Wayne LaFave who has written a three volume treatise on search and seizure. This is search and seizure. Um, you just can't overemphasize the complexity of the topic. So uh, if we were to put more folks it, to, to give you the whole picture, it would actually be sort of a community academy in an abbreviated format. It would take several hours to walk you through uh, the nuances of this. So you had a full understanding of how it works, how we train, et cetera. It, and I'll, I'll take 10 seconds and give you one example. W one of the not constitutional constructs, constructs, but training constructs that has evolved from this is the concept of something called ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. You use deadly force, or you're permitted to use deadly force when those three things are, exist. Someone has the ability to cause serious bodily injury or death, they have the opportunity and there is jeopardy. So let me give you an example. Someone has a firearm. I'm in Burlington, they're in Brandon and they say they're gonna kill me. They have the ability, they have the jeopardy. They've said they're gonna kill me. They don't have the opportunity, they're in Brandon. I'm in uh, uh, an armored vehicle and the same thing occurs. They don't have the opportunity. Um, they are, uh, this is happening now in various places around the country, including Vermont. They have an, uh, an AK-47. They're standing three feet from you. You have two of those prongs. They have the opportunity because they're right there. They have the ability because they have the instrument in their hand, but they're just standing there. They have not created jeopardy. So deadly force is not authorized. So that's just one tiny fragment of the, the enormous scope and depth of this topic that would, I believe would be helpful in, um, in further exploring this. That's not to, uh, I, I wanna be really clear, that's not to diminish the work that's been done on this. I know Representative Lawn has spent countless hours doing research and reading and, um, uh, and is being incredibly thoughtful on this topic. So uh, I, I don't say that to diminish that. I, I just, um, I say that to say there's a, there's a whole other array uh, of information that's potentially possible. Yeah, great, uh, Selena. Thanks, and of course, as luck would have it, an F-35 is flying over my house <laughs> right as I begin to speak, always happens. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask my question because it's a, it's a sort of a bigger picture question, I think. And I really appreciate um, you joining us today, Commissioner, and and your thoughtfulness and expertise um, as always. And and do appreciate the complicated and detailed nature of the the issue that we're trying to tackle here. But I think like a through line that I'm hearing in your testimony and some of the other testimony we've received in f about um, what I'm understanding to be advocacy for, you know, let's create a model policy, but not provide statutory guidance on the use of force at this point. Um, and you know, I hope that's not a mischaracterization of your position, but I, I think that's what I'm hearing. And I, I think embedded then in that um, approach is a little bit of a trust us to get this right um, 
And I think we're here looking at the statutory provisions, honestly, because of an erosion of trust between community and police. Um, and so I, I worry about not giving both police and residents and citizens the certainty on all sides that like statutory guidance would provide, particularly at this moment in time when we do have this erosion of trust. Um, and I just wonder yeah, that's a, that's if a you great would observation. Be willing to comment on that because I, I'm I'm really nervous about not not providing statutory guidance on this and the implications of that. Sure, it's an, it's an excellent observation. Um, it, uh, what I'm suggesting is tell us, telegraph to us what additional um, components are necessary uh, at this point in time based on our collective community standard uh, on the use of force or use of deadly force to be incorporated into uh, the operational standards and policy. And the reason for that is because, I, I, th this is one of the other points I skipped over earlier that I shouldn't have. The vast, one of my concerns is there's a characterization of law enforcement as bad right now. You see signs saying, you know, all cops are X or Y. And uh, that's just not my experience. The overwhelming majority of them are excellent people that you could trust with your children, with your finances, with your car, well, maybe not your car. Um, and they, they want to do the right thing. That is the core ethos. When we've hired correctly and we've trained them correctly, if we screw that up, then we have problems. Um, but they want to do it hyper accurately. They're their own worst critics. And what I'm suggesting is that translation of the advocacy into pragmatic policy. I'm suggesting one particular way to do that where there's direction to create the, the policy that's based on the standard that you're channeling that would set them up for success. They don't want to fail. They don't want to do it wrong. The, the two worst things that you can uh, call a police officer is a liar or a racist, believe it or not. That is not to say that there are not some that lie and some that are racist out of the million to 1.2 million or so police officers in the United States, but 99% of them are not. Um, and they, they don't want to be perceived that way. Um, and they want to do it. They just they want the outcomes to be accurate. They don't want to go home at the end of the day having um, used a taser or hit someone with a baton or, God forbid, fired a firearm at somebody. That's it's not as destructive to their life as it is to the person whose uh, force has been used on. But it, it is destructive to them, to their psych to the psychology, to the to their family life, to all of it. Um, so. We're, I can't overemphasize enough that we're, we're, we're with you. This is not adversarial. It's all we're trying to do is uh, translate that complex operating environment and all of the nuances to all the things that we've got to do and try to find a way to get to where you want to go. That's the most pragmatic and immediately uh, able to be operationalized where the statute, well, it will have it may take effect relatively immediately. We're not going to know exactly what it means for some time. It's that'll take, it could take a decade before we actually know the answers to all those questions. So that, I'm not sure how comforting that is, but that's the, that's the reality of the, of the, the approach. And I just, a follow-up question, or, or maybe maybe it's an observation more than a question, but I'm just thinking about what's going through my mind and want to give you an opportunity to, re to respond to it. Um, I just was really struck by your statement that, um, you know, 99% of cops aren't racist. And I think, I just think about 
what many of us are hopefully learning just about the larger culture and institutions that we're part of and the ways that systemic racism are embedded in those institutions and and that um, not just explicit but implicit bias is is really something we all have to you know and maybe maybe this is semantic but i'm just i'm worried about that assertion and that thinking and i think um that's a great point <laughs> yeah i think you know where i'm going it, so i know exactly stop where there and let I, you respond uh, yeah what i'm saying is they're not overtly racist looking to go out and target people who are of a different race 100 percent uh, of humans are biased. We all carry biases. It, it might be related to race, it might be related to age, it might be related to gender, it might be related to size, uh, country of origin, pick a thing. Um, a great example I heard of that uh, was uh, a, a trainer I worked with in fair and impartial policing, a retired lieutenant from a big city police department, and, and her uh, explanation of that, uh, or one of the examples she gave was, her bias took over. She went to a call where a, a, an elderly man was berating someone at a, uh, I believe it was a hotel lobby, but it was a lobby of some sort. And, and he was just being completely inappropriate. So they got called for a disorderly person. Her bias took over. She started dealing with him like he was her grandfather and he went berserk. And it took four police officers to take this little old man, quote unquote, into custody. The optics of that were awful. And the origin of that going poorly was she didn't handle it the way she'd been trained. Her bias took over and she treated him as a quote unquote, little old man. And um, so it manifests and creates problems in all kinds of different scenarios. And that's why we're so focused on fair and impartial policing. Um, I'm just, my point was that the majority of people, just like the majority of all of us, are not um, overtly uh, taking out um, aggression on on folks of other races. That's all. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you um, still have time, uh, Tom and then Martin. Chief, if you have to go, it, it's no issue, but I just wanted to uh, have you uh, clarify a little more on um, having policies uh, so tethered to statute and th the issues that it's going to bring up with adjusting policy and, and that type of thing, because it certainly does take a lot more time to uh, change statute than policy. And just as a side note, uh, uh, with Seattle, uh, you know, implementing their policies back in, uh, I think it was 2008, um, they're, they're still adjusting today. Um, and to have even to give, a, you know, a, I certainly understand, you know, if we did go to statute and giving you some extra time to implement things that, um, well, six months, say more time doesn't compare to the 12 years um, of experience and um, of things still changing. Yeah, it, it will. Um it will take years to get the interpretations we need to actually craft the training. Um, one of the, uh, the, the way it works now is we're constantly changing the policy and uh, that's as a result of court decisions uh, in Vermont, court decisions at the United States Supreme Court level, uh, court decisions that are happening in our circuit, which is the second circuit uh on a federal level but also looking we spend an enormous amount of time scanning the landscape of things that are happening nationally both in the courts but also just the way standards community standards are evolving and tweaking uh policy uh, not only in use of force but in lots of other areas uh at the same time i think julio thompson uh, testified yesterday about um the interconnection between literally dozens of policies and how uh we script to the greatest extent possible for consistency and outcome and legality, how all those things bolt together. And the more galvanized they are in statute, the harder it is to make adjustments to all of those different things to ensure that we're being consistent as the court cases are constantly churning, as standards are constantly changing, and, th and as they relate to lots of other different policies that we have to bolt together. It's, uh, 
Well, I didn't uh, go to medical school. It is a lot like surgery. It's complicated. Thank you. So, Martin. I mean, I, I guess I want to get a little away from the generalities and in, in talking about these years to figure this out, particularly when a lot of this uh, comes out of civil, uh, out of courts that have considered exactly these issues. So I, I'm, I'm really confused, frankly, uh, of where all these ambiguities are and how all and where precisely. But let me, but, but before I do that, just uh, when we're talking, I'm going to focus on the use of deadly force. And you talked about the concept of ability, opportunity, and jeopardy, which essentially is in our definition of imminent threat, except we use the term apparent intent instead of jeopardy, but that's essentially what jeopardy means. So as far as when use of deadly force can be used, it comports with that concept that is right out of the state police's uh, policy. But let me ask you a specific question, and, 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 and maybe uh, uh, later we can ask some more specifics, but I'm looking at our our definition of, um, certainly our definition of when use of deadly force uh, can be used. And uh, from what I understand, the, the basic definition of defending against imminent threat or death or serious bodily injury, if it's objectively reasonable and necessary, is, is fairly standard. The, the part that seems to be getting questions is, well, what does necessary mean? So I would specifically want to understand what the issue is and where the ambiguity is with respect to the additional language that we offer, which is the use of deadly force is necessary when, given the totality of the circumstances, an objectively reasonable law enforcement officer in the same situation would conclude that there was no reasonable alternative to the use of deadly force that would prevent death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person which I think is essentially last resort language. And that's something that the Attorney General uh, Donovan suggested uh, is what we're after in this use of deadly force. I wanna understand where the ambiguity is in that and how that standard could be so changeable. Well, uh, you, you, it's a complicated topic. You, you, uh, Representative, you actually brought up uh, one of the primary concerns uh, as you were describing the uh, courts interpreting things differently, what can come in, et cetera. That's exactly what happens with individual words. The courts may interpret the word ne necessary differently. The courts may choose to interpret the word necessary um, specific to an individual event or case. They may choose to give a more broad definition of necessary that can be applied uh, more broadly, not to be redundant. We won't know the answer until the courts begin to address each word. And then downstream of that, uh, there was a variety of language. And some of that language is new to the construct uh, that's, and it's different from um, what uh, some of the guiding case law uh, presents now, or it may be the same language, but it's bolted to other things. And the court's job is to interpret that. And as you observe, courts interpret it differently. And they also may choose to narrowly interpret or broadly interpret to get, and so they may give us no guidance and, and only interpret a particular case, or they may interpret broadly and give us guidance that we can apply to other things. And we won't know the answers to those things until they make their way through the system. Well, or, or the legislature, as it does in the section I just read you, can provide the court with the definition that it wants the court to use when, when, when addressing the use of deadly force. I mean, that, um, that's, you know, that's where the court should be looking first is, is to what uh, the plain language of the statute provides. Um, if I, that I don't mean the to argue. I'm just trying to understand no, I, uh, where those ambiguities are. I would, if that's the way it actually worked in practice, that would be great. But I think if you had the judiciary here, they would tell you the same thing. We won't know how it gets interpreted until we see a fact pattern that's connected to it. And then they won't give you a, they can't give you a, uh, a, a, prelim, a, a, a proactive weather report on how something's going to be interpreted. The cool. answer is it depends on a host of factors. So right. I, I do appreciate the fact that you're, tr that, 
what you've drafted tries to create as much specificity for the court as possible, but that's just not the way the system works. Um, it, it, it depends. It does depend. I, I will agree with you there. That it depends on you know, applying this interpretation that we're offering to a set of facts and the, each set of facts could be different. But I would still say that underlying that uh, this is fairly straightforward as far as what necessary presumably means. And it is what some courts certainly look to uh, in any event. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I could go through a lot more of this, but I know you have more time. And, and actually, there's uh, this is subject already to some change, given the testimony that you and and uh, Chief Burke and that we heard yesterday. And I'm hoping to have uh, something that narrows this and hopefully gets closer to something that you find palatable uh, as well as Chief Burke. Uh, but will provide uh, some statutory uh, standards uh, from which policy can be developed. At least that's what I, that's just me. Uh, that's only one of 11, uh, but that, that's certainly something I'm working or hopefully working towards. Uh, I appreciate the, the tremendous effort that's gone into this and the focus yeah. on an incredibly important topic. And I can't stress enough, we're, we're really not trying to put a handbrake on uh, progress and evolution here. Um, I do want to stress we do want to do it right, and I, I just I get afraid that we're not going to be able to do that, and it's going to create, a, to Representative Colburn's um, point, if we can't get it right, it's going to continue to cascade uh, distrust, and that is going to continue to be destructive, and um, it's a really complicated balancing act to try to, to figure this all out. So thanks for having me in. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Great. And I've enjoyed working uh, with this along the way with you. As you, as you know, we, we, uh, we did have discussions back in, what was it, July or, uh, right, where, uh, where many of these, these issues were, were discussed. So thank you. Okay. Thank so you. Th um, thank you, Commissioner. Oh, yeah. uh, Madam Speaker, it, yeah. Madam, Speaker yeah. Madam Chair, sorry. Yeah. I would just like to respond to a comment that Tom uh, made before, uh, which I think was unfair. Uh, as far as any, you know, like making it sound like there's some sort of behind the scenes things going on with the political organizations and such. What, what I did to come up with and try to work on a draft that was presented uh, when we first got back to this is I, I worked uh, by looking at uh, law reviews, I looked at policies, I looked at cases, I talked to a law professor, and then I got some input from state's attorneys and the AG. And by the way, the AG so far hasn't agreed with me on things. And that was it. And then I've incorporated input that we've gotten from witnesses who have testified in front of the, uh, the committee. So I just want to make that very clear. Yeah, my goal wasn't to, or, or even intent, wasn't to make it look like there was any, any behind the scenes uh, activity going on. Um, if I thought there was behind the scenes activity go, going on, I, I would have used those words. So, all right, thanks, I, Todd. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, again, thank you, Chief. I, I think when uh, we had left you, uh, you were responding to the, um, the three terms. And maybe if, uh, if Martin wants to, I think it was Martin's question, or, or Chief, do you remember where we were? We're looking at, um, get my my notes but the uh what was it uh i, I think i was asking yeah. about uh, uh a delay of the effective date and oh, okay and, you know, the, the terms in, in okay yeah nece yeah necessary should have and feasible but anyway okay great go ahead right and i don't i don't want to shrug my responsibilities in that regard but i, I do feel that the commissioner spoke to it and i i feel that drew bloom will also offer the expert level of analyses that goes into these forced determinations uh, in his in his testimony. Um, but, you know, beyond that, uh, I think there's been a lot of discussion about the terms and how long it'll take to evolve those. So I did have one follow up question. I, I, I just noticed that uh, that uh, Chief Burke did send along the policies from South Burlington. And, and I just wanted to note that that was one of the one of the uh, many sources I was looking very carefully at and trying to come up with something to put in the standards. 
Um, and I appreciated that as a very good, uh, very good policy. Um, I guess there's no question there. I just want to put that out. Thank you for recognizing that, sir. If anything else you would like to add or before I see if there are any more questions. No, I, I really appreciate um, all the time I have been afforded. And I think it's critically important that um, you get to discuss this with Drew Bloom. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your testimony. Okay, so Drew Bloom, please join us and welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Is it afternoon? I think I just hit the <laughs> hit the minute. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for thank you for having me here uh, today to talk about this very very important issue. Um, so my my name is Drew Bloom, and I'm presently uh, the director of administration here at the Criminal Justice Training Council at the Police Academy, and I've been uh, involved in Vermont law enforcement as a law enforcement officer in the state for uh, 30 and a half years, and uh, will be retiring at the end of December after a very long, long run of public service in the state. And uh, the one thing that, that I've had uh, the great privilege to do over, over a very long and successful career serving in various assignments and details and and for for a few different agencies in in Vermont I've I've been able to serve in a lot of capacities but one of the things that I've always been most passionate about has been in the realm of instructing uh, law enforcement offers proper moral, ethical, and legal uses of force. And I've been doing that in the state since 1992. And it has been an incredible journey and evolution for me to uh, evolve as an instructor and to watch our training at the academy level and beyond at advanced levels through in-service training evolve over the course of many years. And as a use of force instructor, I'm involved with uh, many different organizations, and I've taught uh, police officers use of force not only in this state, but I've been invited to teach throughout the United States and abroad and in foreign countries as well. And I would like to uh, just express how proud I am of the strides that uh, our little state here in New England has made when it comes to the level of professionalism and uh, the the, eth the ethics and morality that goes into uh, our teaching of use of force. And I can tell you that we are very, very fortunate here in this state in that we have something that so many different states and academies from around the country and internationally are very jealous of. And that is that we have the ability to be standardized and have one program uh, through one academy. When you go to other places where you have multiple academies, uh, some agencies with their own academies, uh, throughout a state, the training can 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 vary so widely from academy to academy that uh, there's just no standardiz standardization throughout. Um, I was invited two times to go teach in Middlesex County, New Jersey, because just that one county alone was attempting to standardize their use of force training so that they could get all the agencies in just one county on the same page. So that's something that I'm very, very proud of. Another thing that brings me a tremendous amount of pride is in 2017, our, our former executive director uh, at the academy here, uh, Richard Gothier, uh, provided me with an article that he, he uh, an article which was entitled the National Consensus Policy and Discussion Paper on Use of Force, which uh, he was provided by his colleagues from IATALYS, which is a national police academy organization. And that policy, consensus policy and use of force discussion paper, I did provide to uh, to to you folks uh, for your own perusal and review. And that discussion paper was authored by, I think, 12 or 13 of the most prominent law enforcement entities in the United States to include CALEA, which is the premier uh, entity that accreditates law enforcement agencies around the United States. And when I first read through that document for the first time, and I've read it several times since and I've provided it to a lot of different folks, when I read it for the first time, I was so proud to, to be able to read it and say, well, we do that, well, we do that, well, we do that. And by the time I got to the end of it, I realized that we already adhered to every recommended best practice that was suggested in that document. And uh, it really was a very prideful moment for me. Um, 
our use of force training, uh, I'll speak first at the most rudimentary levels during basic training here at the academy, is, is a very complex uh, machine that uh, runs over the course of many, many weeks, many, many long days. And then that discipline of just teaching use of force uh, has, a, has a holistic aspect of it that blends with all of our other disciplines here. So eventually, our recruits, as they move through the phases of training here at the academy, uh, get get. Uh, get screened and get uh, uh, tested, not only uh, in use of force, but blended with other disciplines as well, such as patrol procedures and criminal law. And it's through very realistic scenario-based assessments that are dynamic, which prepares them for the actual world. Because there are several different phases of learning, particularly when you're talking about physical skills coupled with academic ones, which is which is heavily involved in use of force. And those phases of, of skills training, we refer to those as the phases of psychomotor learning skills, which are physical skills, which start off as an introductory static phase, a, a, a practice fluid phase, and then a perfection dynamic phase. And so we have to move our trainees through those phases so that we can get them to be assessed and to be uh, efficient in the in the most uh, serious phase of training, which is dynamic, which the recruits uh, don't know what's going to happen. And then we're able to screen them not only for their proper application of force, their reasonable application of force, but their application of the law and of patrol procedures and their application of the de-escalation techniques that they've learned. So we put them through their paces with a lot of different scenarios. I mean, it just not just in use of force, but ranging across the board from from the most compliant arrest to deadly force scenarios to mandatory de-escalation scenarios to mental health scenarios. I mean, there there's a lot that goes into this this machine here. But to to uh, segue back to the most uh, to where I'm involved is is use of force. So not only do we spend uh, countless hours in the gym all day long, linking skills together, working the physical skills, and additional uh, training sessions at night. But there's a tremendous amount of academic uh, classroom instruction that goes into it. Just the PowerPoint presentation alone for teaching use of force has 259 slides in it, which I think has more slides than any other discipline that we teach, which is even more than crash investigation, more than criminal law. I mean, that's that's a lot of material. And those academic blocks of instruction come cover the uh, a wide range of topics, all directly linked to use of force. Uh, everything from stress and what happens to the human body under stress and all the things that can occur during stress when you're trying to process a lot of information during critical incidents to the legalities and reasonable application of force, to the medical implications of force, to dealing with uh, treating mental health and acute psychotic uh, disorders as medical calls rather than calls of investigating a crime and calls of uh, calls for treating something as 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 a as a criminal act that you're going to potentially have to use force on but treating those things as medical calls we address uh, a block of instruction just related to positional asphyxia for making sure that we're keeping people as safe as possible when we do have to resort to using force. Uh, there's even blocks of instruction on how to deal with people's aggressive dogs when you show up uh, on scene at their house. Use of force report writing. I mean, it goes it goes on. And attached to the academic blocks of instruction that they go through in the classroom, there are multiple training manuals that they're provided. They have to have a, a physical skills test at the end of the program where they must perform at 100%. So their score must be 100 to in order to graduate and pass the physical skills portion. They also have uh, two academic exams that they have to take just specific to use of force. Uh, one is a 100 question exam and the other one is a 25 question quiz that happens about halfway through. And then of course there's all the scenario based training that they have to pass in order to successfully complete the program. And that's just speaking from a use of force perspective. Um, I personally have uh, helped a lot of agencies uh, over the years uh, offering some guidance relative to their own uh, policy development. Uh, I've also served as an expert witness for uh, various law enforcement agencies, for the Attorney General's Office, and for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns in federal lawsuits and litigation uh, that surrounding use of force issues. And uh, I've been calling balls and strikes for a lot of for a lot of years. And uh, when when an officer does wrong, probably no one gets more angry than I do because 
I and my colleagues around the United States and with the instructors that I've uh, been very privileged to teach with from other countries take this topic so seriously and we get so angry when we see something like a George Floyd uh, happen. And uh, for all of these years that I've been involved in this and all the different jobs that I've had in law enforcement, the one caveat that I have always had to taking a promotion, to taking a transfer was, please, as long as I agree to do this job, don't stop me from teaching use of force. Because I had some very personal, profound things happen early in my career that wanted to make me uh, get involved in doing this. And I don't need to go into the, the details of that, but I, I can assure you that I, I take this topic deeply personally. And when I see officers do wrong, it really bothers me. And uh, I, I have a lot of personal reasons for that. So in reviewing this legislation, I've been following it uh, from, from the start and have read the different iterations of the bill. And I would like to echo uh, a lot of what Commissioner Sherling uh, spoke about and thank you for your work and your effort in trying to do this, because I would agree also, uh, as was stated earlier, that there has been an erosion of trust in this country between law enforcement and between the public. And uh, watching that uh, erode over the last uh, several months very rapidly and unravel has been deeply troubling to me, you know, as a trainer, you know, just as a citizen of Vermont, as uh, someone who has friends and neighbors here, just like all of you do, and also being part of the law enforcement community at a, at a whole. And uh, the staff here at the police academy have uh, been very, very devastated by some of the events that have gone on nationally. And uh, I hear about it every single day from officers uh, that are out in the field that come through our doors for training. Uh, there are two aspects of this, this piece of legislation, S-119, that I'd like to speak of. The first one, I'm not sure if you've heard about this in other testimony, but it is uh, – I will I will get into some of the some of the uh, detail of what Chief Burke and what the and what the commissioner spoke of. Excuse me. I'm sad to have a sip of water there. But uh, the part of the legislation that I find the most troubling, which I think needs to be addressed right now, is uh, the section uh, that defines what a prohibited restraint is. And I'm not sure if when this was legislated, uh, the unintended, unintended consequences of it were really thought of as thoroughly as they possibly could have been. So I'd like to offer up what my concerns are with the definition as it currently stands, because right now this is a problem for us, and it's a big one because it's a problem because it is in 13 VSA 1032, and it's also in Act 56, and it's there right now. So if an officer does a prohibited restraint by the way that it is currently defined, that's a problem for them because they can be decertified through Act 56. If they don't report it, they can be decertified through Act 56. And they could also potentially be uh, charged with a crime. And there's two aspects of this that I don't really think were, were – uh, identified when it was placed in statute and into Act 56, because there's really two areas where prohibited restraint, the way it's currently described, could happen. The first one is when you talk about uh, a George Floyd situation, a deadly force situation, uh, the use of a, a prohibited restraint, a chokehold, a neck restraint, whatever you want to you want to call it, at that deadly force level. Uh, it can't happen the way that the statute is currently written. Uh, there's no there's no uh, place where that could occur when deadly force is is justified when it's reasonable without an officer potentially getting into into trouble with this. And I would submit to you that the use of a neck restraint, if trained properly, or even a, a chokehold that's not trained and has no training, may still have less physical effect than the use of an edged weapon or a firearm or running someone over with a vehicle. And there may be times when it is perfectly reasonable to do so. And the fear of the law enforcement community now is that when they have to make these split-second decisions uh, that may save their life or the life of someone else, they can no longer do this. And I can give you all sorts of examples. I personally have had uh, someone attempt to grab my firearm over the years. I know two officers that were in fights for their lives when people grabbed their firearms and tried to pull them out of their holsters. And just one basic example is if someone puts a hand on an officer's gun and the officer takes their one free hand and they're holding that hand on the holster and they happen to grab that person by the throat with their other hand, well, that's now a prohibited restraint. And that's a, that's a big problem. That's a problem for officers. 
Um, we have me, never I, taught. Um, I'm sorry, I do see a hand up. Um, so Martin, is it pertaining to that, that section? Sorry, having some mute, unmute problems there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is it uh, Captain Corporal? What's what's the? Uh, I didn't. You catch can just that. call me. You can just call me Drew, sir. That's fine. All right. Uh, so Drew, um, I just wanted to. Say, I, I understand what. Uh, yeah, and you're going to get to your your suggestion, but but I do want you to comment on on this draft number two point four. Uh, is that one that you have or that you've looked at? Yes, sir. I have it here. Okay. okay. I just want to uh, point out where we try to get at the issue that you're talking about. And if you could address whether you think we get there or not. And that is on page seven on subsection eight, uh, where we're trying to make clear there, uh, as well as our changes to the justifiable homicide statute, that uh, a prohibited restraint or chokehold, uh, if it is used in self-defense uh, by law enforcement officer, that is a defense uh, to, to the crime that we have in 13 VSA 1032 for the use of a prohibited restraint. Um, can, if you can comment on, on whether that goes far enough or not. Well, I, I don't think that that addresses the Act 56 issue and I'll get to the, to the word of may which is in the definition in, in, a, in a second of actually what a prohibited restraint is because that's where I, I have a problem but I think that that uh, where an officer can use this I don't think an officer should have to rely on common law for self-defense or the justifiable homicide section because a homicide or, or, or someone's death is is not terribly likely to occur if a prohibited restraint is used properly. Um, I would also think that a, a bullet or an edged weapon or a vehicle would be far more deadly than the use of a prohibited restraint, which would have to be placed on someone in some fashion and held for an extended period of time. <clears throat> so I did submit a potential change, uh, a suggested change to, to all of you this morning, and I sent that in. And I think that it just needs to be clear and transparent. So the public and so law enforcement knows exactly when a prohibited restraint can be used, period, so that there's no ambiguity there. And I did send, a, send that suggestion in to you, and I think that that verbiage may be, may be acceptable, but you, know, you, you folks would know a lot better than, than I. But I did uh, send in that suggestion. The other problem that I have with this is the word may, because we teach, well, first, let, let me back up. In, in basic training, we do not at all teach any sort of neck restraint or chokehold ever. We do not allow any techniques that involve any pressure on someone's head, on someone's neck, on someone's spine, ever, period. And when we have to handcuff someone when they're face down in a prone position, we use techniques that immobilize and control the shoulder, their elbow, their wrist, and officers are required to not put pressure on their back. They're, not, they're required to not put any weight on that person. It's very, very minimal. And they're also required, we teach what we refer to as a talk track, where they actually have to speak to people, and they get tested on this. And one of the questions they have to ask them while they're in the process of handcuffing them is, can you breathe? And that's nothing new. And it's funny because when I get asked that, people say, oh, are you asking that in training because of what's happened nationally? And my answer is no. We've been asking that question for a very, very long time because the medical implications of ha what happens to people when we do use force are important to us because we want to make sure that we're, we are, if we have to use force, that we are, we're using the least injurious options and that we're not hurting people, you know, and that we, that's not something that we want to do. Uh, one of the components of handcuffing, there are six components that we teach in regard to handcuffing people. One of them is called monitor. And that means that that officer that's making that contact with that person, they are responsible for their health, for their safety and their well-being while that individual is under their, their care and control. 
like getting back to the word that 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 I have a real problem with in the statute right now is is may. So it's any technique that may. Well, there are a host of techniques that we teach here that are at far lower levels uh, on the use of force uh, model, use of force continuum, on the use of force scale, whatever you want to want to call it. They're all fairly synonymous uh, that involve controlling people that are actively resisting, that are being uh, assaultive aggression. So they're trying to hurt the officer. Or they're trying to hurt someone else. And some of these techniques involve controlling their head, controlling their neck, controlling their arm, controlling their body, and just letting them tire themselves out so that we can put them in handcuffs. And we can do that with some of these techniques that then we don't have to strike the person. We don't have to pepper spray the person. We don't have to use a taser on the person. We don't have to use a baton on the person because we can just let them tire themselves out. The only place at the police academy in any of our curriculum where we teach what we refer to as a neck restraint, which you could say is a, is a chokehold. However, there's a big difference between a lateral vascular neck restraint and a carotid, uh, cho- and, and, and not a carotid, but an esophageal chokehold that actually puts pressure on the esophagus and the trachea, there's a big difference between the two, but the end result is the same. The person's unable to breathe. It it, it inhibits oxygen flow to and from the brain, uh, but one is far less dangerous than the other. But any any of that, regardless, the only place that we teach them in our curriculum is in a few techniques during the ground defense instructor program, which is an advanced uh, fighting combative school that teaches officers that are already use of force instructors, they have to pass all of that curriculum and be certified instructors first. Then they can come back and become ground defense instructors, which is advanced, so they can go back to their agencies and teach their officers that have higher levels of skill with their basic uh, defensive tactics and use of force skills. They can teach them some skills on what to do if you get into a a combative, uncontrolled situation on the ground. And one of those things in a deadly force situation only is the use of a neck restraint. And we've been teaching those here since 1996. They have only been taught at the deadly force level. And there's, there's a lot of documentation in our program that, that supports that. And the officers are told very, very clearly that if you cannot reasonably articulate that the use of your firearm or a vehicle is justifiable, you cannot use any sort of neck restraint, period. The problem that we have with uh, the, 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 this, this word may, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, excuse me. Um... Martin, did you want to? Yeah, well, no, I still, I, no, after you, you're done with uh, explaining the May, uh, the directly, and I'm understanding what you're saying, it's making sense to me. If you could go, and I understand with respect to this crime, what you're asking for, uh, if you uh, can comment again on, on the um, uh, S-119, that page seven, if, if the way we're dealing with it in the context of the use of force standards, use of deadly force standards, if that's sufficient there, uh, understanding you now that you want this and with directly with respect to the crime, but you finish up what you uh, were talking about with May. But I do want you to to address uh, the other part too, if you could. Well, yes, and yeah, yes, sir, I'd be happy to. And and I think in that suggestion that I sent this morning, I just think I would like it to be very clear, and it would also then codify what we already have in training, which would be perfect for us and would be wonderful for us if this is to become uh, law and, and be in statute. But I think in my, my suggested verbiage here for it to say, you know, notwithstanding under this section, and then it goes on to say, you are a law enforcement officer is permitted to use a prohibited restraint if use of deadly force is justified, period. And if it's not, then you can't, period. And uh, I, I'm, I think we'd be fine with that. But the, having the word may in the definition then really muddies the water because there are a lot of control holds where you have to control someone's head, where you have to control their neck, but there's no pressure. You're not putting pressure on them. You're not putting a, putting any pressure on someone so that you're going to stop breathing. But to have the word may in there, well, the answer would be, well, sure, if you're going to put pressure on, then it, there's a lot of different things that could stop someone from breathing. But we don't train those. So having that word in there effectively removes a, a, a myriad of tools from our toolbox of techniques that we can use and replaces them with nothing. 
So now officers are, are to say, well, I guess I could try to do this, but I can't do that anymore because it may, you could make the argument that if I were to put additional pressure or force, well, sure, that may uh, cause a problem with breathing or blood flow. So I guess I can't do that. So I guess I'll have to use strikes or I guess I'll have to use my taser or I guess I'll have to use my baton instead. And that's exactly what we don't want because, of course, we always want officers to use the least amount of force or the minimum amount of force or only force that's necessary necessary. And we spend a tremendous amount of time on uh, avoiding conflict. The first thing that I tell these officers and instructors when they come for instructor school to get certified as use of force instructors is this isn't about your ego. One of the, the tenets of our program is to sacrifice ego to avoid conflict. We teach what, uh, what we refer to as the four A's of good defensive tactics. And the first one is situational awareness. That's the first A. And the very second one is avoidance which is avoiding conflict through the use of de-escalation. And we have a whole separate block of instruction that is not even part of the use of force de-escalation, which teaches de-escalation. And we're looking and hopeful to get more all of the time. And another aspect of de-escalation that I spend a lot of time teaching that people don't really understand and talk about unless you, you, you live in my world is that we have to train officers not only to use de-escalation so there's no fight, but we have to train them to recognize when de-escalation must occur, but the fight is still happening. And no one really ever thinks about that because they, when they hear de-escalation, they think about using all sorts of techniques to avoid any type of confrontation, which is, of course, ideal. And if that was the case and we could always do that, then I wouldn't be a use of force instructor. But it, more importantly is when I say the fight is still on, there may be a moment where there's a physical conflict between a subject and an officer. And in that one particular moment, based on that subject's actions, looking at it in its totality, looking at all of those facts and circumstances that are occurring in that second in time, an officer may have the ability, let's say, I can use a, a baton as an impact weapon when that person is being assaultive and they're displaying assaultive aggression. So that person is actively trying to physically cause harm to the officer or someone else. And there are a lot of other factors that go into this. You have to, we're just making a hypothetical here, assuming that everything's equal because there are a host of perceptual factors, which also the statute does attempt to touch on, but you, there's several that are absent. But aside from that, the officer may be justified in that moment to use their baton as an impact weapon rather than as a, a control device, which is what we, we teach its primary use on, which doesn't get a lot of, of, of public airtime either. But the primary use of a baton that we teach is using it as a leverage tool to control people mechanically and anatomically so that we can handcuff someone that's bigger, stronger, and faster than that officer and has a size, weight, and strength advantage over them. But I may be able to use that as an impact weapon. But now now, in that split second, the subject goes from being assaultive to just actively resisting. So now they're not trying to hurt the officer anymore, but they're still fighting as hard as they can to avoid having that officer control them and place them in handcuffs. And in that, in that fraction of a second, the officer has to be able to say, oh boy, I can't use that baton now to strike the person, but now I have to transition to a, a lower option and that use of force continuum, and I can no longer do that. And having officers be able to do that in that split second when you are completely overwhelmed with that moment in a situation where you're either fighting for your safety or the safety of someone else that they're, they're trying to stop an assault on, that's very, very difficult. And that exists now. And that's a part of de-escalation that we, we work very, very hard to train. So getting back to my point about this word may, I would like to change the definition so that it's very clear, so that it says uh, if, it if it directly prevents or hinders breathing, reduces intake of air, or impedes the flow of oxygen to the brain, then that is what a prohibited restraint is. And I think that's the goal of what the legislature was trying to do, because we want to avoid having people, you know, be experience, you know, what, what George Floyd had to experience and what shocked and appalled and mortified all of us when we saw that. And I think that's 
that's the goal. And I think changing that verbiage will do that because then it will allow us to continue to use that host of lower level techniques that we already have in the toolbox that don't inhibit or prohibit breathing or blood flow at all. But they do involve, you know, some control of someone's head and neck and their body and their hand. It's difficult to explain these things if you can't actually see or experience these techniques. But I could demonstrate and would be happy to demonstrate these things for any of you at any time, uh, even, you know, do them on you or someone else and say, are you having a problem breathing with this? And your answer would be, no, I'm not, but I would be able to control you. You know, I'm, I'm a 50 year old, 175 pound man, and I can control someone that is much stronger, much larger than me using some of these control holds without striking them, without using a taser, without using a baton and just hold them there and let them get tired so that I can handcuff them a lot easier. And for that reason, I'd like to see uh, and have have your uh, your help to make some changes to this definition because where it is right now, it is it exists in law. It's part of Act 56, so we've been stripped of some of the techniques that we can do, and this is an immediate problem that I, I think needs to get fixed right now. So I guess before I go into the the rest of the bill. If there's any questions about this portion of it, which is what I find most concerning, I'd be happy to take those questions now. Sure, thank you. I do see um, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Drew. It's pretty eye-opening because, um, you know, everybody watches the cop shows. <laughs> and uh, and it appears a lot of times the first thing that, uh, that uh, police do is go for the head and that type of thing. But, and, um, and I just thought it was, uh, um, I guess a standard practice. And from, from what I hear you saying, it's, it's not a standard practice, but um, I, I do have a little uh, grappling experience and, uh, and I'm, I'm an MMA fan <laughs> and it's, it, it is in, incredible. Uh, that, I mean, that there's a saying that, that um, I'm going to guess you've probably heard is control the head, control the body. And you can control somebody's body just with a, a, a very firm grasp on the back of their head and, and make somebody do what you want them to do. And, and, uh, and, and that is, that's a very uh, simple uh, and easy technique to, um, to, I guess you could say to master and, and it's, there's no harm in it. And, and with, with to have something like that be um, um, prohibited, uh, to me, um, it, it just wouldn't make any sense at all. But but I, I wanted to thank you. Uh, we had on our agenda to uh, to quit at twelve thirty, and 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 I and I have to leave at twelve thirty, which is one minute away. But but I just wanted to thank you for your testimony, and uh, um, I'll look forward to going back to our video and listening to the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you. Any. Other questions before Drew continues? And committee members, I hope um, those of you who can stay, please uh, please do. Appreciate it, thank you. Okay, Bryn, I mean, uh, Drew, <laughs> go ahead, thank you. Thank you. So, so I would appreciate some help from from this committee to help uh, make that fix right now. You know, as soon as possible to just change that definition and and to place in there. You know, exactly when a prohibited restraint, which is I think what we're all trying to to, to avoid, that it can only be used in a deadly force situation. And I think the law enforcement community would be relieved to see that. I think that they would be relieved to know that uh, you know their their lives are, are valued also in these deadly force situations. And, and also potentially for protecting citizens. And, you know, just one other example I, I would give before I move on is, you know, if, if someone is on the ground and, and, and someone is on top of that person that is murdering them, you know, an officer may have to use a prohibited restraint to pull that person off, which in my view would be a lot better than using a firearm and potentially risk hurting that person that's on the ground being murdered with one of their own bullets, either passing through the body of the perpetrator or missing and striking that person. 
person. So it's just another another example as as to why I think we don't want to have officers having a second guess in these in these split second second moments. So so thank you for for uh, for listening to me go through this. Uh, as far as the remainder of the bill goes, uh, there was one section that does uh, kind of flesh out some of the perceptual factors that go into forced decision making, and it and it mentions things. Uh, I, it's uh, section. Um, it's right on page two, section D E, where it says factors such as age, size, relative strength of the officer and subject, uh, and whether the officer and the subject uh, is injured or exhausted. Well, those are some of the the perceptual and physical and environmental factors that go into forced decision making. But there are there are a lot more that we teach and train. So I wasn't sure what the intent was in placing that specifically in the statute. And did you mean for that to be you know, just some of uh, the the examples, or would you like a more in, all inclusive list? Because we have a fairly extensive list that we use here at the academy, and that list also also becomes part of the calculus for reasonableness when we're trying to look at whether or not an officer's use of force was lawful. So could, could someone answer that question for me? Sure. Um, this is uh, Maxine Gret. I'll, I'll start and um, looks like Martin has his hand up. So it's interesting because some folks have, uh, some of our witnesses said, just take all those out um, as opposed to add to it. So I, so I appreciate you asking us, you know, which way to go and, and um, should you give us more to add to it? Um, I think I, I'll, I'll defer to Martin and then possibly come back, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that, that is uh, one of the, the, the questions and I, I guess I'd, I'd rather ask you uh, what you think, uh, Drew. The, the one option is just to say all the facts known to the law enforcement officer as well as uh, conduct issues that we have in the start of that definition and just exclude uh, A through F because you know those would be part of them, uh, and there's probably more. But I will also say that the idea here is under our Vermont law, when we say these facts may include, that means may include but is not limited to. So these are just examples, and any other factors or facts that are relevant uh, could be part of those totality of the circumstances under this language. But I guess, uh, you know, so that I think answers your direct question. But the other question I would have for you is, do you think it's better to leave it more open ended or should we should we have this list and even add to this list? Well, I, I think if it's I think that if this does come to fruition and its intention is to guide a policy, then I think it should be a more extensive list that uh, that uh, parrots training. But you know that's not that's not going to ultimately be for me to decide. But I, I think if you're going to list some, then I think it should parrot training, and I think that should also parrot policy. But uh, you know there there's there there certainly are some more critical you know factors that I would include if I was going to put place these on a list. And so in seeing that, I was just wondering you know where that came from and where some of these things came from and why others were omitted. And I do understand that it's not meant to be all inclusive and that it's you know this is just some but is not limited you know it, that this is all. So thank you for that explanation. So if if it if as this evolves, if you would like, I can certainly provide you with with a list that would parrot what we use here in training, which uh, offer a lot of uh, of critical factors. One of which is being on the ground in an uncontrolled situation, uncontrolled combative situation, which is where the officer is still struggling with someone, and now they've gone from their feet to the ground because their own equipment that they're wearing on their belt, on their external carriers, not to mention the environment of traffic, rocks, curbs, ice snow, those things can cause a lot of injury uh, to the officer and to the and to that individual. So, you know, that's just one of one of the, the many items on my on my list here. So, so but, let me uh, just, I would be happy to provide that to you. If I could just follow up. Uh, so if you could comment on, on if we just don't have that list at all and just keep it uh, open. I mean, is that a workable solution as well? Because then yeah, so let me just back up. I mean, as you probably have listened in on this testimony, the concept here is to have kind of an overarching statutory standard and, and actually rely on policy, uh, hopefully model uniform statewide policy to flesh out some of these issues, such as the totality of circumstances. 
frankly, I, after this testimony of the last couple of days, at least, at least I am leaning towards uh, just having the general language and leaving the lists and such to policy. I mean, if you could comment on, on, on that. I, I think that would be acceptable. And I don't see a, a major problem with that. To, but I think when you get into lists, then, then you get into some confusion. And I think it's right. best to, to leave it to say, you, you just keep it very, very, very brief. Um, so I'd like to get into the into the standard that we teach now, because of, out of all the academic blocks of instruction that I teach and train, the reasonable application of force is is by far the, the most critical one. And not only do I teach it at the basic training level, but we feel that it's so important that for the last two years I've been teaching it as an update to field training officers who have to come back into the academy for recertification as FTOs, and they've had to uh, go through this block of instruction again. I've also been Brought, the, brought this block uh, of instruction uh, on the road many times and have taught it to all sorts of different groups and, and stakeholders uh, so that they can understand the current constitutional le legalities of what officers in Vermont and elsewhere in the country are held to. And I'd like to refer to it as Graham Plus because not only do we uh, adhere to the Graham standard here, but we also look for a direction from not only our own second circuit, but from other circuits around the country and we've incorporated those into our training here in Vermont. When the governor first uh, first uh, formed the Commission on, on Mental Health, which that, uh, that working group assesses, you know, high-level uses of force uh, and where it was involved uh, with, with individuals that were suffering from some mental health issues. When that, when that group first was convened, I was invited to speak to that group and go through the block of instruction that we teach here at the police academy, which is known as reasonable application of force. And as Commissioner Sherling uh, uh, eloquently stated, much a lot, a lot more eloquently than I can as a speaker, is uh, he said that in order to teach this, you really need several hours. And that really is exactly what you need to walk someone down the path so that they can understand and the complexities of the legalities of use of force and just how difficult it is for officers right now to have to make these split second decisions. So this is a fairly, fair, that, that commission on mental health is a fairly eclectic group of professionals that have tremendous passion about being on that commission. And I went through the entire block of instruction on reasonable application of force as it should be conveyed. And as I did that, at the end of it, there was not one critique or criticism in the negative. It was all in the affirmative that they were they were very, very pleased with how extensive a time that we take here in Vermont to teach our officers to do things right. So that Graham standard, which has been around since 1989, has also been uh, echoed by our own uh, Vermont Supreme Court in the case of Colby, Just, uh, Colby Johnson in the city of Rutland, where they also, our own Supreme Court, adopted the Graham standard here. But officers in Vermont are liable right now, not only at the state level, so that if they make an unreasonable seizure violating somebody's uh, constitutional rights, make an unreasonable seizure violating their civil rights, they're not only liable uh, civilly and criminally at the state level. I mean, at the state level, they can be charged with simple assault, with aggravated assault, with manslaughter, with uh, uh, attempted murder, or with, with homicide. But they're also liable at the federal level under uh, Section 42, you know, U.S. C-242 of the Civil Rights Act, which is the criminal side, where they would be investigated by the FBI and indicted uh, criminally. And then of course, they can also be sued uh, on the on the uh, civil side in a 1983 lawsuit. And I've been involved in several uh, civil lawsuits involving law enforcement officers over the years. So there are penalties both at the federal level and at the state level that exist. And in every piece of litigation that I've been involved with, uh, always three things are immediately asked for uh, when, when there's any, any, uh, any threat of litigation occurring. And those three things that always get requested are uh, the, the agency's use of force policy, the officer's use of force report, and the officer's training records. And those three things are, are requested in every single case, every single time. And policy, when you talk about use of force policy, uh, one of the very first things that gets assessed is whether or not the officer violated their agency policy. And then, of course, we want to read through their report to make sure that they followed uh, the guidelines that they were trained when they document everything that they did, documenting their force. And we want to look at their training records. Prior to 2018 in Vermont, which you 
you, some of you may find this incredibly sh shocking, but prior to 2018, which is not that long ago, there was no requirement in Vermont for any law enforcement officer as part of their continued training through Rule 13 to have any use of force training once they left the police academy at the basic training level. The only training that they have to have that they would have to undergo prior to 2018 was to qualify with their department firearm in the basic state qualification course once a year annually. That's it. No use of force training at all after the academy. Now, fortunately, we've got about 125 certified instructors out there that work for various agencies, and most of our agencies understood that this was a deficiency, which is why they have their own in-house instructors, and they would do their own training annually, quarterly, whatever that may be, so that they, they took it upon themselves to adhere to the recommended best practices, which was to have as much as possible. But prior to 2018, there was no requirement. Requirement. And when I when I uh, left working for for uh, DMV enforcement, I was a captain there uh, when I left there to take this job at the academy to finish out my my career. But I'd been teaching here as adjunct staff since uh, the mid 1990s. Uh, one of the very first things I did was add to our administrative rules through the help uh, of the council that at least we have now an annual requirement so that officers have to have and it's not a lot, but at least four hours of use of force training a year that has to be under the direct uh, supervision of an Academy Council certified instructor and has to be from our program. So that's not great, but it's a start. One of the startling statistics that was that was uh, discovered by the Four Science Institute, which is a, an entity that assesses uh, the human body and stress and what happens to the human body, particularly in law enforcement under stressful high threat encounters, was one of the things that they determined that in North America, law enforcement officers, most law enforcement officers get less use of force training uh, throughout their career than a junior high school wrestler gets throughout their wrestling career going Going through junior high school. So that kid going through junior high school is going to get more training in junior high school wrestling than a police officer will get outside the academy once they graduate throughout their entire career. And that's a pretty shocking uh, thing when you really stop to think about it. So if we really want to prevent injury and if we really want to reduce uh, officers misusing force, uh, if we really want to do that, the thing to do would be to increase the quality of training standards. One of the things that the Training Advisory Committee uh, here at the Academy uh, determined after a lot of work, and I'm not part of the, the TAC committee, but one of the things that they determined was that they wanted to add additional time to basic training, which would have included two more full days of use of force. But we were denied that, and we were denied the funding for it. And if we had the time, I would love to provide more training, and I would love to provide more training out there. But getting back to the standard that we train right now through Graham, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court gave us a wonderful tool when they came out with the Graham decision and that they, they gave use of force experts a, a calculator so that we could look at each officer's involvement in a particular situation and they gave us a calculator to determine whether or not the officer's actions were reasonable. So the things that we have to look at is referred to as first the four-prong test to Graham. We look at the severity of the crime or the severity of the situation that the officer was responding to, which is how big a deal was it? The second thing that we have to look at was whether or not the person on scene that the officer had to be involved with, the person or persons, did they pose an immediate threat to that officer or to another person? And that word immediate means literally right now. Is this happening in this split second moment of time? Then the court said, we want to know, is that person actively resisting and attempting to evade uh, the facilitation of control? So when you look at that term active resistance, that means that that person is now taking an affirmative physical action to resist that officer's uh, uh, efforts to control them. And the final the prong was whether or not the circumstances were tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. And in the Graham case, 
they said, we're going to look at the, these four prongs, see if they exist, and the assessment of reasonableness has to be based on another reasonable and prudent officer's perception based on the facts and circumstances known only to that officer at that moment in time without the benefit of 2020 hindsight. And they said, now, we realize that each officer's perception, each officer's experience is going to be slightly different. So we're going to look at all of the different perceptual factors and environmental factors factors that go into this decision-making process when we're trying to calculate reasonableness. And this is where those factors such as age, size, strength, skill level, uh, being injured or exhausted during the confrontation, being within close proximity to weapons or having weapons, being uh, on the ground in an uncontrolled situation, being outnumbered, more suspects versus one officer or more officers with one subject where you're generally going to have to use less force. We have to look at all of these factors to see what was present at that time because you can never make an absolute decision in use of force. I'll try to, people try to pin me down all the time when we're discussing use of force, cops or civilians alike. And they'll say, well, Drew, if somebody's got a, got a knife and they're coming towards you, you can use deadly force, right? And I'll say, well, maybe. And they'll say, well, what do you mean maybe? It's a knife. It can kill you. It can cause serious bodily injury or death. And I'll say, what if it's a four-year-old? You know, or what if it's a 98-year-old that, uh, that's got dementia and has walked away from their, their senior living center? Well, that's not going to be a deadly force situation. You're probably going to walk up to them and take the knife away and bring them home. So you have to look at – you can never, never say in absolutes uh, what, what force can be. We can speak generally, and we can say, sure, generally if this happens, the officer can do this. And we use a, a, a term here called the control superiority principle, which I believe you did address in this bill when you – refer to it as proportionate force. And of course, that's what we, what we train to because it must be proportionate to the, to the level of resistance that's encountered. And that's something that we work very hard to train. So getting back to the Graham standard, I mentioned earlier in my testimony that we use what we ref like to refer to as kind of Graham plus, because not only do we take the Graham decision, but we look at other, other uh, federal cases and we have coupled those to our training. We refer to that as uh, the risk benefit standard or quantum of force. So not only do officers have to choose the uh, reasonable force, they have to use a reasonable option based on all of those circumstances in that moment. But if they have any time whatsoever. They have to not only pick a reasonable option, but they have to assess and pick the most reasonable option that is likely to hurt the person the least. So they have to, they have to take into account when they're judging whether or not an, officer, uh, subject's, uh, an officer's actions rather were reasonable, we have to consider the risk of bodily harm that that officer's actions, uh, what, with what they did to the suspect, based on the threat to the public that the officer was trying to eliminate, was their force selection reasonable, and could they have, have used used a, least, a less injurious uh, uh, force option? Could they have chosen a less, a less injurious option? We also uh, teach at the academy that the officers are required to consider uh, other alternatives of capturing and subduing people whenever they have time. They're taught to create space, to create distance, to create time. And we also want our officers to consider what they know about someone's physical health, what they know about someone's mental condition, what they may know about someone's other relevant frailties. And those are all based on court decisions, uh, some from the, from the Ninth Circuit and, and that, I, that I can think of off the top of my head that we teach right now when we teach reasonable application of force. So I would also, now I'm going to kind of pile on to what Chief Burke and what the commissioner said in the use of the word necessary. And that gives me concern, and I would agree with what uh, the chief and the, and the commissioner said, and I don't need to reiterate what they said because you heard that loud and clear. But you can never, ever know what the least amount of force was. You can never know what the minimum amount of force was. And an officer can never really know what the necessary force was. They just can't, which is why the reasonableness test has lasted for as long as it has lasted, because there's a good calculator to make that determination. And here's an example. If I've got somebody 
that points a firearm at me and it looks real. I don't know it's a toy. I think it's real. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. The person has the ability. They have the opportunity. And now there's jeopardy slash uh, AKA intent. So we know that this could happen. So an officer's reasonable response to that is going to be that my life or in the case of that firearm being pointed at someone else, someone else's life is in immediate jeopardy. So a deadly force response, possibly with their firearm, uh, would be warranted and that would be justified and I don't think anyone would argue that that's not reasonable but say the officer says put down the gun and the person does it immediately well the least amount of force the minimum amount of force the force that was necessary was nothing more than a verbal command but how was the officer to know that? Now, ideally, would we like them to give the verbal command? Of course we would. And we train that and we expect it and we would hope that they would. But there may be times where that's just not possible. The person doesn't hear it. It's not tactically feasible. I mean, you could go on with the hypotheticals, but right. you just Thank can't you. know when that moment is. OK, great. Thank you. I do see two hands, uh, Martin and then Coach. And I realize that we are um, over time. This is this is really very helpful. So that's so I appreciate folks staying. Uh, Martin and Coach. Yeah, I, no, I, I really appreciate your testimony. This has been real, real interesting. Um, but I guess I'm confused a little bit because it sounds like you're already training to what the bill is trying to get at with respect to having a little more meat on the con the concept of necessary. Uh, you, you talk about training that, you know, if you have any time, you have to pick a reasonable option that would cause the least harm or something to that effect. And, and what I, what we have in this bill, this proposed amendment, it says the use of deadly force is necessary when given the totality of the circumstances, an objectively reasonable law enforcement officer in the same situation would conclude that there was no reasonable alternative to the use of deadly force that would prevent the death or serious body. I mean, I don't see how that is really different from what you're currently training to. It's just putting it in and saying, you know, well, now we have a standard and we are, you know, when you say gram plus, that seems to be the plus. And, and I'm a little confused on why it is not. And, and, and what you just explained, as far as those two scenarios, those would come out uh, through the determination of looking at the totality of the circumstances. Uh, I don't think the, it changes what necessary necessarily <laughs> means, uh, but I just, I'm just kind of confused about that. Well, well, I think, sir, the, the issue, I, I would agree with, uh, with the commissioner on this, is that it's not tested. And then I also think the term necessary can be subjective. And I think to, you can never really under, know what someone's you know, intentions would be if, if the officer didn't go into the room or didn't step into the hallway. And to say whether or not that was necessary invites 2020 hindsight, which Graham specifically said you cannot use when you're assessing reasonableness. So here's an example. In patrol procedures, we teach officers not to stand directly in doorways, don't stand directly in a hallway, because it's just not tactical and it's not safe. So let's say there's a circumstance where an officer uh, is trying to not stand in the middle of a hallway because there, there may be a subject in the hallway and he doesn't know if that subject's armed or not. It's a contentious, dangerous situation, whatever it is. We'll just, we'll just imagine for a second. So that officer now, let's say that he's, he's trying not to stand in the, he or she is not trying not to stand in the hallway in the threshold, but there's a big flower pot in the way. So your training says, well, you're not supposed to stand in doorways, but because there's a big flower pot in the way, the officer kind of steps into the doorway. And now they see the, that the person has a weapon, the person sees the officer, they point the weapon, the officer uses their firearm, and they kill that person uh, very sadly and tragically. So awful situation for the person, awful situation for the officer. So now you could make the argument that, well, in your patrol procedures curriculum, it says you should not stand in doorways. And the officer's going to say, well, there was a very large planter in the way, and uh, so I, I stood in the doorway so I could avoid the planter. So now you can make the argument to say, well, it wasn't necessary for you to stand in that doorway. You should have tried to move the planter because you did something contrary to training. So you helped create that jeopardy to, to bring in, to, to create the three sides of that AOJ triangle, to create that ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. And that's my fear because it's not tested, because we don't know how 
how the courts are going to uh, going to uh, determine what that word means. And I think it, it, it opens us up for subjectivity. And that's that's my fear. So, it's just so ambiguous. Me, so I think okay. that's that's my okay. concern. Yeah, thank you. Right, so, so let me follow, follow up. Mar Martin, hold on. Follow up with that? Um, yeah, hold, hold on, please, because so, we are we are over time and I see the committee um, members are meeting. So I would like to take no more than 15 minutes and let's do a, you know, a hard stop at about 10 after. I do see that coach has had his hand up um, for quite a while. Um, so can so, I just follow up on that real quick, though, uh, yeah, if I can? Quickly, and then I'd like to get to coach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So so Drew. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to to get into the standard, uh, the plus component of what you're talking about, the gram plus, and I think the gram part we already have in there for the, our subsection one. I'm looking at just the deadly force component, and we're trying to get at the plus component with that su uh, subsection two, uh, C two, and, and it goes right to what you were just talking about in training. And if you can ponder whether there's different language for subsection two that gets at closer to what you're talking about as far as in training that you're already training related to necessity, uh, related to your quantum of force, risk benefit standard, et cetera. Uh, and, and I'll just uh, you know, ask you to ponder that and, and, and perhaps if you can uh, you know, send an email about that or I can talk to you later uh, about that. So, so I won't use your time on that right now uh, so that we can get to coach's question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Go ahead, coach. Thank you. And then, uh, and then we'll try to wrap this up. Okay. Uh, thank you. And maybe I can help with that a little bit. Um, I went back to um, when we first met um, Mr. Bloom, which was on January 28th. And uh, you gave us a very uh, good detailed description you know, of your work at the academy, uh, you know, uh, breaking down the, the the time frames, and so what it what it gets back to, and the reason you were with us back then was looking at the data reporting side of it, you know, and that goes back to the incident reporting and to the Graham component, um, and. You know, you had mentioned that, you know, it, up until, you know, uh, 2018, um, you know, we were not uh, continuing, you know, training. Uh, and you were hoping that we would amend that, uh, you know, for future uh, continuing ed uh, training. Uh, so that being said, to get to Martin's, you know, question, I mean, Ms. Representative Lalone's question, um, just looking back at that testimony, it seems that um, we're not far away <laughs> from a solution, you know, here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just looking back at some of the comments uh, that you made uh, back then, and um, it would be interesting to see your, or hear your thought as to if you were king, what would you do to change the paradigm? Oh boy, you don't want me to be, <laughs> be king. <laughs> uh, oh, no, no, I, no, I really appreciate it. You know, <laughs> you know your ability and capability. Uh, you know, I I remember your first uh, visit to the joint committees. So. Well, I, I guess I, I guess uh, you know because of the, some of the ambiguity of what I'm reading in the statute here, I, I think I express my concerns, and there's there's no need to there's no need to harp on those. But uh, I do think that for one, I would love to see a statewide model policy that involves everyone and all of our stakeholders and all of the the critical components of our society that have a say in it. I would love to see that. And that's also one of the things that I've jumped up and down on for, for years saying, why can't we do this in Vermont? You know, we have statewide model policies for some other things. What's more important than use of force? And I really think that would be uh, one thing that I think would be a good thing for Vermont, just like additional training time. But of course, you know, the, of course, the use of force instructor is going to say he wants more training. But uh, I, I think that that would be that would be my biggest wish 
is to really see see a, a mandated policy that uh, everyone is forced to to abide by. And I'd also like to see some mandatory use of force reporting and what the commissioner talked about um, in regard to a, a statewide you know clearinghouse where all use of force incidents that go beyond compliant handcuffing are reported. Because for one, I think the public has, has a right to know, you know, what, what amount of force their officers are using. You know, they have, when, and I'm, I feel very strongly about this, when people dial 911, they have an expectation of what's going to show up at their house. And it's, an, it's incumbent on our enforcement officers to be the most confident and competent people that, that Vermonters have a right to have, that they pay for with their tax money, me being one of them. So I think that having a use of force reporting clearinghouse would be wonderful because then me as a trainer, I could look at well, what are we using force on the most? What are we using force on the least? Which techniques are we using the most? Which ones are we never using? So perhaps could we jettison those from training and put our time and effort into other things? And I think that as a training tool, that would be incredibly helpful. So I think uh, you know, with a couple of points in my king crown would be a, a a statewide mandated policy and also uh, a clearinghouse for all use of force reporting. Great. Well, thank you. Thank, thank yeah, you. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. And we'll certainly share that if you haven't already uh, with house government operations. Um, okay. Your, um, your testimony has been enormously um, helpful and interesting and, uh, and certainly uh, if you have more thoughts, please reach out to us uh, either through email or, or glad to have you back um, or meet with you separately, but certainly you've given us a lot of, a lot of very helpful um, guidance. So uh, committee members, thank you so much for, for staying. Um, sorry that we won't get to, to Julio, Attorney General's office, uh, but we do, um, we have been speaking with the Attorney General's office. So uh, Julio, we could either meet with you separately or we'll be back in touch, but um, I just, I think, given we have to be on the floor now, uh, I think we do need to adjourn, so. so. It would be helpful for me. There's no there's no plan for me to testify before the committee in the future, or you don't know yet? Um, I, there I don't are other know. Committee, there are other bills next week, and I just need, I need to be able to, you know, size it up. Yeah, no, we will be continuing with, um, with this. And so, um, and I think okay. our first committee, I think we meet on Tuesday, Thursday, okay. and Friday. Um, Okay, so thank you. Sure, why don't you plan on joining us again? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Julio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, Kelly, hopefully you're you're good for this afternoon. Assuming we go ahead with it, it's a little unclear, but but hopefully you should be good. Just to re do redo what we did yesterday, but in more detail. Um, yeah, well, I think if we if you actually report the bill, um, yeah, it, you could do it in, in some more detail. But I but I still think that even not quite as high a level, uh, but not actually reading the entire section by section. So somewhere somewhere in between. <laughs> so I'll try to be there this time to uh, <laughs> do my part. Okay. So Martin, did you want to catch up in a, in a bit or? Uh, yeah, let's catch up. Yeah, yeah, I do need to figure out what I'm going to say this afternoon as part of my report, but it shouldn't take long. So yeah, you want to call me right away? Sure. Okay. All right. All right, great. So we are going to, uh,